Did society really need any more evidence that special licenses and perhaps a bit of bespoke training were a really, really good idea for those misguided souls who think that they might like to hook up a three and a bit ton acoustically transparent effluent carriage and truck off down the highway at 100 k's an hour, living the dream. I'm John Kenogan from AutoExpert.com.au and I get new cars cheap. Australia only. Website. Car. Imagine a world where any brain-dead pelican in practice can get a license in a Mazda 2 or Yaris just by making it around the block and not crashing or dying. And then shortly thereafter, upgrade to a mighty dual cab ute. <laughs> and that Taj Mahal of effluent totin' wobble boxes head off into the sunset and commit the following brain-dead road-going atrocity. Perhaps, just putting it out there, we might need to talk about this like grown-ups. This report is sponsored by NordVPN. Living online is obviously awesome, but it's also kind of risky. You've really got to make sure you don't leave the door open to cyber attacks, data breaches and hackers. And that means you need to put some countermeasures in place now. Using NordVPN is a simple three-step process. You just choose a subscription, you download the app, and you connect to a NordVPN server. One click, and you are protected. NordVPN shields your IP address from scammers, and it secures your online traffic with state-of-the-art encryption across as many as six devices. Go to nordvpn.com slash AEJC now, and you'll get up to four additional months months free, plus you'll get Nord's rock-solid 30-day money-back guarantee. That's nordvpn.com slash AEJC. Link in the description. NordVPN is the fastest VPN on the planet, and it only costs about as much as a cup of coffee every month to keep your data, your identity, and your devices secure. You'll be browsing online, shopping, listening to your favourite podcasts, and streaming video in complete privacy. And that includes plugging the holes in dodgy public Wi-Fi if you are connected remotely while travelling. All up, that's a pretty small price to pay for enhanced cyber security. Go to nordvpn.com slash AEJC now to get much safer online and enjoy those extra months of free NordVPN subscription time. It's totally risk-free with Nord's 30-day money-back guarantee. That's nordvpn.com slash AEJC. Link in the description and thank you to Nord for sponsoring this episode. Dashcam Owners Australia, which is an awesome YouTube channel, and you should absolutely subscribe. The content, it's brilliant. It's crowdfunded, right? And yet so compelling. The only downside, I guess, to subscribing is that you'll be spending a lot more of your life online watching videos than is even already the case. So there's that to consider. Anyway, the tow vehicle in question here is a Ford Ranger, and the driver, at least in my estimation, has failed the most basic spatial perception driving test of all time by attempting to fit the combination into a space insufficiently large. Like, dude, interference fits have their place. They're quite useful when you need one, but you never need one doing that out on the frickin' highway. And in my opinion, for a bunch of reasons, that is one of the most dangerous manoeuvres that I think I've ever seen. And the reason I'm going to take the piss out of it is because if I say what I really think, it'll just be unpleasant, like it'll get everyone down. So piss-taking is just 
the only mechanism I've got for coping with this kind of bad behaviour on the road. Because in my estimation, overtaking a road train at high speed with such a heavy van behind, that's a fail. And then doing it with insufficient space, given the traffic environment and the proximity and closing speed of oncoming traffic, that's disgraceful. And then knowing that perhaps you're doing something stupid and pressing on as opposed to just pulling the ripcord early on, hitting the brakes and tucking back in behind the road train when it's safe to do so, this is also a fail. Like, what gets in the head of some people? Why do they remain committed to such stupid behaviour on the roads? Like, nobody died in this case, which is a miracle, but it could have easily been quattro dBs and all of the knock-on effect. Like, can you imagine the knock-on effect for the families and the first responders and the medical professionals back in emergency departments who have to pick up all of the pieces when that happens. All you've got to do is change just a few of the variables, just massage them a bit around the edges, and we're looking at a highway full of dead people, basically, and a spot on the news, and you never want to get on the news in that way. Anyway, James Reason is a guy you've probably never heard of, but he's the father of kind of risk management and disaster analysis. And he's got this model for it. It's called the Swiss cheese model, right? And the thing about Swiss cheese, obviously, is the holes. And it's a metaphor, okay? So if every risk factor in a particular situation is a slice of cheese and you get them all together and you throw them up in the air, once every 100,000 throws, all the holes line up, and a disaster has a pathway to steam on through. And that's what you're looking at here, in a sense, right? Because the decision to overtake, the existence of the road train in that location, the proximity of oncoming traffic, the decision not to back off, towing such a heavy van with such a comparatively light vehicle, all these things are slices of cheese. And when they all line up, a disaster steams on through. And this isn't the worst disaster that could have happened. This is just a particularly profound, uh, you know, crash. Like, it's spectacular, I guess, and a few sets of brown trousers all round, as many as four, but no real tragedy to consider. So I guess if there's a silver lining here, there's that. But you want to think about the Swiss cheese model when you drive because you've got to be the one who's responsible for pulling different slices of cheese out of alignment and blocking the pathway for disaster. Because substandard engineering, civil engineering of the roads and dickheads all around, that's a given, right? You've got to be the one whipping the slices of cheese out of alignment by increasing margins of safety, looking further down the road, overtaking conservatively, things of that nature. This would be my core message to every driver, not just people who tow. If you tow something, and if that something is big and heavy and unstable, then you've got to try even harder to yank those slices out of alignment. Much harder than our hero did in this video. Anywho, I'd suggest that's also driving that many people would consider to be typical of a ranger driver. Like, no concept of dynamic instability or what can go wrong, no regard for not only his own life, but the lives of other people on the road in close proximity. And I'm not suggesting that there's any malice involved here. It's ridiculous to think that anyone wanted this to happen, but there's just no regard for the potential, right? And this is how these tragedies happen. It's like apathy leads to something that really nobody considered was likely because everybody's basing their behaviour on the script of what's happened previously when they drive. And, you know, if you get away with it for the last hundred times, then 101's going to be okay, right? And it is, until it's really, really not. So that's kind of what's happening here. And me saying that these kinds of vehicles, you know, pig trailers with the centralised axle groups, I always say that they're unstable in your and they need only a relatively small influence to make bad shit happen. Well, 
this is kind of an example of that. According to drive.com.au, the van is a new age big red porter hovel. Porter hovel is my determination, but new age and big red, that's on them. And I think the one in question in the video is actually something that they call the big red club lounge. Sounds exclusive, doesn't it? Like gentleman's club. It's got overtones of gentleman's club or VIP area, something of that nature. Anyway, according to them, the travel length, this is big red now, according to them, the travel length is nine metres, which is 29 and a half feet, even though they refer to it as a 22 footer. That might just be the box, not including the drawbar and whatever's hanging off the back. Who knows? Anyway, it's a bloody long thing. It's nine metres long. And a ute is about five and a bit, typically. Okay? It's a Duos Axle Caravan. And it comes complete with a washing machine. <laughs> I do hope it survived. Otherwise, well, the underwear is never going to be the same again, is it? And the price of these things, dude... It's north of a hundred thousand bucks before you add any options. Like Jesus Christ, that's Duos Hundred Nights in a five-star resort where they'll make you a mojito and there's hotties by the pool. So I just don't get the attraction. I so don't. Perhaps it's this: with a long spatula, you could actually. Take a dump and continue to flip burgers and not have to disengage with the conversation for your VIP guests in the club lounge. So I've never wanted to do that, but I suppose some people do, and that might be the attraction. I mean, they've got one of those concertina kind of doors betwixt the, let's call it, kitchen and the water closet. Not unlike a way cover for a lathe or a milling machine, but you could leave that open and flip the burgers and remain engaged with the VIPs. And I can imagine the aroma, the, the frying patties on the stove and the unmistakable scent of, um, let's call it, microbial digestion. It'd be something, wouldn't it? And this mighty device, this... Big red club lounge thing. It'll carry 110 litres of effluent, 55 each. You and that of your lovely wife on tour across the nation with 55 litres each of your own effluent. I wonder what the ancestors will make of that when they, you know, look at the Twitter and Facebook posts you've made about it. The tear of this van is 2.8 tonnes and the aggregate trailer mass, like fully loaded, is 3.4 and it puts 250 kegs on the tow ball if you're interested. In a ute, of course, the thing that is at risk of being blown in every one of these heavy loaded uh, configurations is the combination mass. Like the GCM is the thing that's easiest to blow. And if we assume that the Ranger is an XLT, the curb weight of XLT is 2230 kilos. The GVM is 3200, so we're not at risk of blowing that, as I see it. But the gross combination mass of six tons could be pretty close to that. So I just had a look at that, like a cursory estimation of where we're going to be on the GCM front. So if we put Duos people in the Ranger, that's like carnivores, 200 kilos, let's say. If we've got to add a tow bar, and that's going to cost about 40 kilos, and we've got that awning that you see in the video, that's got to be 30 kilos, probably more. Items on board the ute, it's not very difficult to get up to two or 300 kilos with items on board the ute because you'd want a fire extinguisher for outback travel, you'd want a second spare tyre, you'd want some recovery gear, you'd want some water just in case you decouple and go for a bit of a drive. You, these things are kind of important for survival, right? So it's hard for me to see you getting away with less than 200 kilos of crap in the ute. Crap, essential crap like that. 
And let's assume that we got the van sort of only halfway loaded to its ATM, which would be 300 kilos of stuff in the van, you know, doilies and whatever, you know, raffia, dick warmers, whatever, doesn't matter. So that's the van loaded at 3.1 tonnes, plus the curb weight of the ute at 2.23, plus 470 kilos of crap in the ute. That's 5,800 kilos, which is only 200 shy of the gross combination mass. Although, if you fully load the van, you'll be 100 kilos over on GCM. And you'll probably be over on towball download, unless you're pretty careful as well, and you weigh it to confirm. What I'm saying is, the limits on these vehicles are completely unrealistic in the context of safety and stability, and... This guy has got to be, you know, sailing pretty close to the gross combination mass limit, if not over it. And how would you know now that it's all just shrapnel all over the outback, you know? So it could easily be legal, but possibly also technically overloaded, almost certainly dangerous and unstable in extremis, however, in either case. So... In that context, I would categorise this as an absurd combination to drive a long way. I just would. Such an unstable heavy trailer, like these things are, untr are intrinsically and intrinsically unstable because they've got these axles in the centre and that makes them intrinsically unstable pitching to and fro and yawing like this, like rotating like an LP record in a horizontal plane kind of thing, okay? It's not that that van in particular is unstable, it's that all pig-type trailers are unstable in pitch and yaw. That's just the nature of the business. And the driver, okay? I don't know how else to categorise this, and it's only my opinion, but insufficient training and or insufficient ability to be let loose on our roads with a combination of that nature under his belt, like... Given what could have gone wrong here, the number of dead people that could have flowed from this incident, with just a little tweak going back in time, tweak the variables just a little bit, and we wouldn't be laughing about it afterwards, I'd suggest, at all. And you are looking at two of the luckiest motorcyclists on earth. Like, where else could they go? They could only stop, and this thing is coming towards them. There's a road train on the other side. I guess they could have ditched into the table drain, but if they went into the table drain, that's where the van ended up, right? So that could have been a flat-out disaster also. So pretty lucky for them. Now, here's what Twitter said about all of that, because Dashcam Owners Australia posted this video on Twitter on the 24th, and there's been 50 or 60 different replies at the moment. A dude named Lee said, just misjudged the length, can happen to anyone. Really? Well, Lee, I'd suggest that if you think that that can happen to anyone, and by extension, anyone includes you, then just... Get your licence and whip it into the shredder, dude, because I don't want people who think this kind of thing could just happen sharing the road with me. I don't. I want people who are in control sharing the road. Like, it's not going to happen to me anytime soon, A, because I'm never towing a caravan, but B, if I were, and I've towed plenty of two-ton things in my life... I'd be just double-checking on the conservatism of every manoeuvre and I'd be on it mentally. I'd be making sure that there was more than enough distance to overtake and I didn't have to go too fast to do it to increase the risk of instability and I'd make sure that the gap I had to retreat into after the overtaking manoeuvre was completed was beyond sufficient for the length of the combination. And that's just where we've got to be, that's where you've got to be, it's where I've got to be, if we drive a freaking car, like Jesus. Troy boy now. What a complete tool with no regards for anyone else. It's regard, Troy boy. But yeah, I agree with you. But I don't think there's malice involved here. Like nobody decides to do this, like maliciously, not have any regard for anyone else. They just go, eh, I'll go for it now. And what can go wrong? A Twitter account... I kid you not, called Elon Musk's bunghole, says 
There should be a ranger danger app that alerts people whenever a ranger is within a certain radius of other road users. And uh, Mr Musk's bunghole highlights an interesting point to me because there are some cars that are magnets for particular groups and Ford has done an ace job just drilling down into the bogan psyche of mainstream Australia and putting together a vehicle that just has that like ultimate bogan magnetism and not all ranger drivers are dickheads obviously but that vehicle does seem to attract a greater than average number of dickhead drivers <laughs> i get agree Craig Packer now, Packer, says, What effort did the truck driver make to keep the road safer? None. I'd suggest that the road train driver is on a hiding to nowhere because he can't just nudge a couple of wheels, in his case probably, you know, 40 wheels or something, off into the table drain on the left because otherwise a whole road train could just depart in a dynamically unstable way these things are long they're like 50 meters long or something so there's that to consider and then what are his options he can't really speed up because the thing is so heavy he is gaining on the truck in front you can see that from the video but if he breaks then what he's doing in real time you got to think that we're not all just sitting in our lounge rooms looking at this going, well, what would I do? Because you're not him in that situation with that unfolding in real time. If he hits the brakes at the same time as the ranger driver decides to hit the brakes, right, then all he's doing is cutting off the ranger driver's retreat, right, and making the situation even more dangerous. I'd suggest that he did exactly the right thing, which was to continue at exactly the speed he was driving at and thereby not be a variable in this equation, like not be an unpredictable, Jesus Christ, I never thought he'd do that kind of thing. Because at least if the road train driver is doing the same thing and continuing to do the same thing, then the ranger driver can decide to hit the brakes or whatever without playing this ridiculous game of me too with the road train driver. So... I can't, in good conscience, look at that and go, the road train driver did anything wrong. Sorry, dude. Aussie Hex says, Take note of how fast the road train stopped. That's 55 metres, 120 tonnes of truck. Yeah, he did manage to pull it all up pretty quickly and pretty stable as well, which is something of an achievement with a vehicle that long, I'm sure. Mr Hex goes on and says, he was on the brakes trying to give this Muppet some room well before the accident. Two things there, dude, do us. I don't see him being on the brakes at all. I've watched that video multiple times. It doesn't appear to be happening at least the way I look at it, and it's not an accident. Accidents, we've got to stop calling them that. Accidents are almost like an apology, like it's all already opening the door to, well, nobody's responsible. These things aren't accidents. Accidents are... Things without apparent causes. You can be the king of England by accident, like it's an accident of birth, but you can't crash a car by accident. Dude. Mr Hex concludes by saying, and also very likely flashing his likes at the bikes, saving them. Well, who would know, but the bikes did escape by the skin of their scrota, did they not? And if the truck driver flashed his lights and helped, then yay him. Rod Amos says, don't these people realise they're driving a dynamically compromised vehicle before they hitch a van to its saggy ass?" And Rod, I'd have to say, hear, hear, hey women, brother. Part of driving to the conditions, in my view, is with respect to the nature of the vehicle that you're driving. And that is the biggest failure in this whole Sorry, Saga, because those vehicles, utes and the derivatives of utes like Pajero Sports and Everests and Fortunas and things of that nature, they are dynamically compromised, right? You put something big and heavy on the back, they're even more dynamically compromised. But they can be driven safely and 
this video is quite instructive in the domain of how not to do that. Like overtaking at high speed, big mistake, in such a dynamically poor vehicle with such a heavy trailer. Like, come on. This is a raft of bad decisions, meaning a whole bunch of slices with multiple holes up in the air and a disaster steamed right on through. Thanks very much, Professor Reason from Manchester. So, amazingly enough, nobody was hurt and the Ranger didn't roll. <laughs> I don't know how. Thank God that the van, the Porto Hovel Chitois, just disintegrated as it rolled. It just turned into shrapnel. It looked like, you know, door-to-door -door in Fallujah after the mother of all bombs. Anyway, the New Age doesn't actually see it that way in respect of their effluent carriages. Their commentary is subtly different. They say on their website today, quote, at New Age caravans, we want every adventure you and your family embark on to be as safe as it is enjoyable. And I'd say, even in this case, you've achieved equality of safety and enjoyment. So, well done there, New Age vans. We achieve this in a number of ways by selling caravans to anyone, irrespective of their qualifications to tow them responsibly. First and foremost, it's not their requirement to do that. It's not on them. First and foremost, our caravans, pop tops and campers are the only ones in the world that feature a walk and shore, hot dipped, galvanised chassis straight from walk and shore station. <laughs> Who doesn't want that? Me, sir. Designed and engineered by Australia's high performance experts. The chassis offers a whole new level of stability and control, an unparalleled strength, durability, and reliability. It's a sad indictment on other vans, is it not? Quite interesting, though, and therefore remarkable that other vans don't simply just disintegrate under their own weight on the showroom floor, if that is, in fact, true personal opinion. <laughs> the after photographs that were posted by Dashcam owners Australia just look like what I imagine an IKEA Porter Hovel would look like before assembly. You got a dude just standing there, he's looking around for the right sized Allen key or something, and he's saying, Don't you worry, darling, I'll have this all back together in two shakes. So, what can we derive from this sorry state of affairs? Like, the sons of anarchy, the lucky sons of anarchy. I'd suggest they each bought a lottery ticket and got properly hammered just down the road at the crack of Dawn Hotel. Dawn was especially pleased that they had managed to cheat death again. A dipshit regulators, well, doubtless they spent the evening patting each other enthusiastically on the back and elsewhere over the shit-hot job they're doing, keeping the Dingo Piss Creek Highway open and safe for the public, for the beard-stroking, effluent totem public, by basically allowing anyone who's been driving a Mazda 2 or a Yaris for all of their working lives to just retire and blow the inheritance on a dual-cab masturbation chariot and... Then go out and buy the Burj Khalifa of effluent carriages and head off into the grey nomad sunset, living the dream. If you don't mind, I'll have that freaking annular cutter back. I don't mind telling you a story, but don't try stealing my tools. Dashcam Own Australia has won the coveted brown trouser Logie for providing endless entertainment and proving post-COVID reality is actually substantially more fucked than fiction, but a lot more fun to watch, you know, provided you don't end up starring in it.
So there's that. And Big Red Toten Ranger Man, who was sadly cut from the Marvel Avengers Endgame movie because the studio had a budget thing and they didn't want to make Thor look like a pussy in any case, has taken one of those vile poop carton wobble boxes off the road once and for good. Ooh, thank you. And demonstrated just how severe the depreciation on one of those unbelievably stable and reliable, durable, palatial hovels away from home can actually be if you make a bunch of bad decisions, but press on anyway and hold the door open when the spatial perception gene was handed out. In other news, extraterrestrial life yesterday extended its moratorium on contact with the human race, except, of course, for the occasional nocturnal probing. Coincidence? 